Got 20 seconds. I'm on a man to go. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Good. Get those knees up. Explode. Good. Explode. Let's go. Up. Rock four. Let's go. One more. Go. This is the Fight Strength Podcast, NSFW, presented by Breaking Muscle. What is up, fighting and fitness fans, and welcome back to an all-new episode of Breaking Muscle presents Fight Strength NSFW. I am Jason Burgos, senior editor for MMASucker.com, and back with me is my podcasting amigo, returned to us after a trip to the other side of the planet. He is the strength and conditioning mastermind of some of the best fighters in the world at America Top Team, the one and only Felipe Daru, or better known as Phil Daru. Phil, what is going on? I missed you, man. What's up? Oh, man, it feels good to be back. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I feel good. I feel good. I feel well rested. In, in Russia, I got to I got to actually sleep in till like <laughs> 9 o'clock because nobody trained before 10 o'clock in the morning. Oh. So it was really good. You know, and I'm well rested, ready to go. Now, today's show will be an entire. It will be entirely based around our weekly Ask the Roo segment because you know while Phil was away, he was just straight up inundated with a bunch of questions from listeners and followers. However, that will be the focus in our second segment. First, I wanted to get into details about what Phil just mentioned in his trip to Russia. I mean, you know, for those you don't know, he was away for a few weeks in Mother Russia doing some work with a, a bunch of great, talented fighters at ACB Berkut. You know, uh, uh, absolute championship. You know that 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 co- that company. You know, that connected to them. So it is. It's it's really quite an achievement to be asked to go to a foreign land and run seminars as a strength coach. But even more crazy and wild and impressive is to be an American and go into the former Soviet Union because you know you're so highly skilled and your your value is that highly regarded. So that's it's, it's pretty damn cool stuff to to get to talk to you about this. Um, so I wanted to take the you know first segment just do this to chat about it. A uh, little interview style thing. It's been a long time since I interviewed you. Uh, so mm-hmm. first off, how did this whole thing come about that you got set up to end up going and working with these guys in Russia? I think it had to do with – I have a lot of guys that come from that side of the planet, um, <laughs> come to American Top Team. So uh, I think they seen a couple of the Instagram posts and things like that. We got involved there. And then uh, one of the fighters at my gym is is closely connected with Barracut. So – he contacted one of their strength and conditioning coaches who then contacted me through WhatsApp, which is, if you know what WhatsApp is, is like how you communicate with everybody overseas. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he, he hit me up and then basically this has been going on for like three months. We've been trying to coordinate times and things like that because I had fighters fighting, you know, jo- Joanna just fought, Dustin was going to fight, things like that. So I wanted to make sure that I was there for them in camp and not just leaving them for two weeks. So, I finally got it all coordinated, and then, uh, you know, we, uh, I, I, I didn't know exactly what they wanted me to do. I just knew that they wanted me to reinvigorate the program or just reestablish some basics and, uh, and the scheduling with uh, just, just overall bringing it back to baseline and, and really figuring out what they need to do from a physical preparation standpoint. Now, I mean, the, the first – other thing I was thinking along with you know how it came about what was that travel like because I mean you really are going to the other side it's not like even just crossing the Atlantic or the Pacific you know you're going across all the way across Europe and like how did you do it did you go across Europe did you go to California and around that way like how long which way did you do it and how long did it take to get there I think if I would have had to go to California, I'd have to shoot myself man that was that <laughs> too long no I what happened was I I flew to New York and then from New York went to Moscow. From Moscow, we flew in like a ten-seater jet plane to Chechnya, which is where I was. Where where Berkut is is in Grozny. It's a small town, um, but a but a pretty up-and-coming town. I'm not gonna lie. It uh, had a little bit of city vibe to it. And then you have little subtowns on the outskirts or villages. That's where Berkut. Uh, the fight club was and then they have another barefoot mma it's kind of like for general public mm. in the city itself and then i did another small seminar at a local like power powerlifting bodybuilding gym there in grozny as well just uh working on like uh, my gluten hip activation techniques proper iap intra abdominal pressurization stuff that we got from kabuki and dns and things like that so i was just kind of going over that and then i did like a small 
uh, clinic on squatting and, and uh, bench pressing. And then we just did like a little workout. People were, it was, people were really accepting, man. Really, really, um, they were, I don't want to say honored that I was there, but it, I felt that way. I felt very humbled that they were so accepting of me and wanted me there and were taking pictures with me and just, you know, being so, you know, non what we thought of, of like Russia, right. you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and, and especially in Chechnya, um, people are very peaceful. You know, obviously they had their differences, you know, a couple of years back and they went to war and things like that, but they're really on the come up now. And even the president actually, he actually, uh, mentioned me in one of his speeches. Really? Um, didn't, didn't mention me by name or anything uh-huh. like, like that, but he did, he, yeah, he did say something about, well, he, he pretty much might as well have, he, he said something about an American sportsman coach coming uh, over to, okay. to our, to our local warriors and helping them out. So they're, they're, they're on the come up, man. I, I, I really love that area. And we'll be going back there every three months. So I'll be going there. I'll be a, a, a familiar face for those guys. How long was the actual flight, like from New York to, to Moscow? I think all together it was like 20 hours. Holy Moses. Yeah. Wow. Um, now, I asked Tony Ricci this when he filled in for you last week when we did the FSP overtime. How does the process of communicating your message through an interpreter work? Like, does yeah. fitness have kind of a universal language and it's not a lot easier than it seems? Or is there a bit of a, like a learning curve between you and the interpreter and getting the message to the athletes? Yeah, so we had a tra- I had like three translators and they all would like kind of, you know, sub out <laughs> because – I've had, I was, I was training either a big group or I would train a small group of their like high level guys. And when you don't have a translator, we were working through a a phone app and that was just giving me real, this is like, give me real problems. I was actually getting a little aggravated because, (laughs) and, and the guys are real nice, man. And it's just like, they don't get it. And we had a, we had a small intern there or like young intern Uh who was uh who was trying to relay what I was trying to get out and he's I mean he follows me he follows me on Instagram so he understands what I do mm-hmm. but he couldn't relate it from a language barrier you know so the language barrier was very hard uh but when the translator got my rhythm and I mean also I was speaking in terms trying to speak in scientific terms that make the program make sense mm-hmm. uh but also it's hard because try to say modalities and, and, and <laughs> yeah. periodization yeah. in another language. And they kind of don't even know it fully, mm. you know, English like that. So <clears throat> it was tough to kind of, I had to really dumb it down. I don't want to say dumb it down, but it had to be yeah. based on, you know, but yeah. uh, at the same time we got, we got the message through. Uh, and now the guys, man, and, and I'm going to say one thing about these guys too, is that they're con- completely focused and they took to my programming, you know, 100%. They didn't, they didn't second guess it. They didn't look at me weird. As soon as I said something or I showed them something, they did it. And the great thing about this was I actually walked into a uh, training. Uh, I think they were sparring. And then I walked in afterwards, and I seen the guys actually doing the warm-up and the uh, cool-down drills that I showed them and I actually mm-hmm. told them to do. Right. They were doing it on their own in a group on the side of the, you know, on the side of the mat, which is very, you know, that's something for me that, that, that makes me feel good. That makes me feel happy, you know, because they're actually taken to what I'm trying to tell them and they're buying into the system. And, uh, you know, some, I don't even get guys sometimes like that at American top team doing, (laughs) doing that, you know what I'm saying? So far less sass from the Russians than the Americans. Oh man, they're so diligent man. they're, 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 they're focused on what they want and they will do whatever it takes to get it done. Now, um, what would you say at the skill level of these fighters in this? I mean, this they're connected with a major promotion out there in Russia, uh, one of the, if yeah. not the biggest. I mean, is it like a sort of a, a Russian uh, American top team? Like, are there some really talented fighters out there? You kind of maybe are scouting a little bit for future work, maybe. <laughs> I won't say I'm scouting, but I, I would say <laughs> I would say that they have some serious talent, man. We know that though because some of the guys come to American Top Team. Yeah, very talented wrestlers, grapplers. Um, good strikers, you know, they, they could work a little bit more on their striking. They're very tough, obviously. I, I walked into a sparring, and this was just like a, a quote-unquote technical sparring with little gloves, and they were going at it like they were in a true fight. Wow. So, I mean, I was like, damn, okay, well, this like is... Like shoot-a-buck style? 
Yeah, pretty wow. much, man. It, it was it was just like that, man. And you know what's funny was that the I didn't I on my Instagram I kind of spanned the location and and seen the compound, but you really couldn't see the whole thing. It looked kind of like a gladiator like training ground. Okay. You know, have you ever seen like the 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 uh, the stars episode on on Gladiator? You know the Gladiator movie, uh, the show Gladiator, right? The show Gladiator, no, I know the movie, but I don't know the show. Well, well, even even the movie, like yeah. you've seen the battle, like the uh, practice, the practice yeah, yeah, battle. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. They had that basically in the back of the gym. I was like, this shit is crazy. <laughs> and then, and then, like, yeah, man. And then, you know, obviously everybody is well taken care of. There's dorms up there. You know, um, nobody eats. Uh, everybody eats for free. You know, there's a there's a five star restaurant in there with the five-star hotel Hmm. you know and i stayed in there for free and it was just it was awesome it was a good experience you know but these guys are fully taken care of they are 100 percent dedicated to what they need to do and they're talented i mean there's a couple guys that could fight in the ufc right now um that i know that could fight in the ufc and be very you know uh be in at least the top 10. would you say so less maybe less like an att and maybe even it might be more like uh the ufc training center since it's directly connected with this promotion so uh, similar to yeah. that maybe a, that training center is kind of copying off of what acb or, or Kut's doing i don't know if they copied off them but i i, I did get a uh, a good sense of the same implications of what they're doing is what they're doing is what ufc performances to is doing because it, it i mean it is all the guys that are training there are in ACB. So, I mean, there's nobody there that's in the UFC or in Bellator or anything like that. Everybody's in ACB and even the young guys are in ACB, you know, or they're in a, a sub-level ACB. It's like a, like an amateur division. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, and they got young kids in there too. They got, the, they had little kids in there. Wow. Uh, like eight, nine going at it, fucking spawning. <laughs> I was like, damn, okay. You know, Gangsta. and then... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was cool, man. And then, like, I had to, I had to also learn the language, and you know, I, I've learned a couple words here and there to get me by. And then, you know, eventually, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to speak like true sentences. But it's such a, a different language. It's not like Latin. It's, you know, it's, it's so, it's a little choppier, you know. Yeah. And like Spanish, I can kind of pick up, obviously, pretty quickly. Italian, same, but. Mm-hmm. It's different with Russian, you know. They're they're just a different type of uh, style, but now, I'm getting there. Now, what tech? I mean, you mentioned a little bit earlier what kind of stuff you were working with, but were there any specific techniques and strategy you really want to focus on? That was the plan when you went over there for these guys. I mean, did they get the full Daru playbook, or they just got a little taste of the Daru playbook? No, I mean, I try to give them as much as much information as I possibly can. I gave them a true protocol for. Uh, proper periodization from from just phase one, phase two, on all of my program and what we do from there. Like, and and then also gave them a full on diet for cutting weight and then a cutting weight protocol seven days out. So they got all of that, and then also a um, a recovery method or protocol that I do per uh, training session. So if it was like a uh, if it was like a weight training session, they would have a different type of recovery protocol. If it was a uh, aerobic work or cardio or sparring session, they would have a different type of uh, recovery protocol there. So it was all listed out and then given to all the fighters there. So every time I do this, and I want to kind of do this around the world, and I've been asked to actually do this in other in other countries too as well, is going in there, kind of revamping the program, seeing what needs to be fixed, and then you know formulating a program to help them progress further as an organization or as a team. So what? Another before I get you know your final thoughts on the whole thing, I have to ask, what was the food like? Because I mean, are they? It's a very this is a clear signs of globalization in Russia. Like they have a lot of these big franchises you might know from around the world, or you know, what's the the mix? Do they have a lot of them? Do they have various food of the of the world, or is it just yeah. good ass Russian stuff? No, I mean Ro- Moscow definitely has well well diverse food you know i even seen a starbucks and a, and a kfc if you watch my instagram I, <laughs> nice. I post that up. like starbucks is everywhere mm-hmm. in chechnya they had a place called star coffee which was cool you know what i'm saying it was kind of like funny it was like yeah. it looked like starbucks but it was like different it was like a star in the middle <laughs> a it was red still like star green. it was now it was a green emblem okay. it, was, it was like trying to be like starbucks but it was actually good coffee man it was right. um yeah, yeah i mean i ate well and there was and there is a well diverse uh like a, array of food there so 
it wasn't like there was only Russian food, but they did have some food that I that was you know especially for Russia, and uh, it, it was good, man. I'm not gonna lie, I, I did have it, and, and you know what? The food there is so much the nutrients. It's more nutrient dense. So like I was actually eating like milk products and goat cheese and mm. and I was eating cottage cheese and curd and I wouldn't do that in America like it's just the hormones they pump into the cows mm. they do you know, things like that yeah. the, the the genetically modified you know organisms that are in all of our foods here yeah. in America oh, it's yeah. just not there you know what I'm saying like mm. literally they go and grab the chickens out in the back cut them up and then we eat them you know what all I mean right. so I mean not to offend any vegans but <laughs> It was I mean, good. it's like they don't know that, that that's what happened. But, I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, final thoughts. I mean, overall, a few uh, – a couple sentences of thoughts. Uh, your uh, your experience going to Russia in general. What would you think of it all? I got one thing I want to talk about, actually. At the end of my trip mm-hmm. – I wasn't going to talk about this, but I am going to say it because it was a funny story. <laughs> it's a funny story now. It wasn't that funny when it was happening to me, and this is – all right. I told only a few people. Oh, boy. Wow, now, you're telling the world now. No, nah, this is it. Here we go. So <laughs> on my way back, right, mm-hmm. it's all good. I'm, I mean, I've been there for like 11 days. I'm ready to go home. You know what I mean? I want to <laughs> see my family. I want to get back to American Top Team. I want to train my clients up here. Um, I, I'm like, I know I have a long flight. It sucks, whatever. So I get, I go to Chechnya. All right, fly out of Chechnya. I go to Moscow. Now, mind you, I have to go from Chechnya to Moscow in one airport and then drive to another airport to get on an uh, international plane to New York. Mm. So, but that plane wasn't leaving till the next day. No problem. They, they got me a hotel right next to the airport. So it was all good, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I spend the night. I wake up in the morning. I take the, uh, I take the shuttle bus over to the, the other airport that's going to take me to New York. I get online to go get my boarding pass. They look at my passport. She's flipping through the pages, Mm-mm. and all I see was "nit," uh-uh. and, I, and she she pointed at my she pointed at my visa, and my visa was expired. Oh no! Yeah. So what happened was I had a I had to get a rush visa when I when I started to uh, with this whole process, right? Yeah. Because I didn't I didn't really know I had to have a visa to go to Russia, okay. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, I had, I I put down for a 30 day visa and what happened was it wasn't going to get to me in time for my first flight that was booked. So I had to, uh, change my flight over to about a couple days later. So when I put down my visa, it was the day, it was like the 11th. Now, mind you, I wasn't leaving till like the 16th now because I was supposed to leave on the 13th, but I wasn't going to fly out because I wasn't going to make the flight because I wasn't going to get my, my, my uh, passport back in time. So what happened was they, when I put the 11th, they put right from the 11th to 16 days, only got a two week visa, man. So, which made kind of sense because I'm going there for two weeks, right? Yeah. 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 But I was supposed to be going there from two weeks from the 13th. Exactly. So now I'm leaving on the 16th. I didn't even think to check the, (laughs) I didn't even think to check the expiration, right? Why would I think to check that? Because I thought I had a 30-day visa, uh-huh. right? So either way, I get there, and then when she tells me that, my heart just dropped. Uh... So at that point, <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit, I'm not I'm not leaving here for another month. There's no way, right? <laughs> so this whole time, I'm like, what do I have to do? Now, mind you, nobody speaks any English. Uh... No. And I speak about maybe four to five words. <laughs> <laughs> Six if we're lucky, you know what I'm saying? And then I'm in the translation in, in, in my iPhone trying to figure it out. On top of that, I have no cell phone service in this airport. Uh. On top of that, nobody's up from my handlers, like all my handlers and all my like my translator. Nobody's up. It's 7 in the morning. Remember, they don't get up to like 10 in the morning yeah. over there. So nobody's up. Oh, my man. wife is clear across the, the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> yeah. It's like two in the morning over here, right? So can't even call her for like any type of validation or help, right? Mm-hmm. So now I'm by myself in a Moscow airport, knowing nothing, possibly not gonna make it home, right? Mm-hmm. My flight is at ten o'clock. It is now eight o'clock. Oh. I had to rush over. She wrote on a piece of paper, go to go to another terminal, which was like 
a fucking lifetime away. <laughs> now I have all my bags. I'm running through the Moscow airport trying to find a way to get my get my visa back in order, right? Mm -hmm. I finally find a way to a help desk. They tell me to go talk to the console. The console, basically, you go to a phone that's in the middle of the wall. It's a black phone, and you just pick it up. It's like there's no dial. You just pick it up, and he answers it. So I picked it up. They start speaking Russian. I said, English, English. <laughs> He's like, yes, yeah, let me help you. How can I help you? I said, I need to get on a plane. I need to get, I'm a U.S. citizen. I need to get back to America. Uh, so basically, I had to call the U.S. Embassy. Oh, man. I had to call the U.S. Embassy. I had to uh, email my my visa and my passport in, you know, in a picture form over to them. They had to then go to the ambassador and actually f write a letter to him, and he had to he had to approve me going back to the United States. This was all supposed to be done, hopefully, in two hours. This did not happen. <laughs> yeah, right. So I missed my play. I missed my flight. I was supposed to be home Wednesday. I got home Thursday. Damn. Now, mind you, she said it would take up to three hours, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sitting in this airport for five hours now. Ugh. I missed another flight. So now I don't, I'm, I'm at my wit's end. I don't even think I'm making it home. I think it's a wrap. So now I'm stressed out. I'm pretty much pissed at myself. You know, and I just want to go home. It was snowing out. I'm like, it's cold as shit. I haven't seen the sun in about, ten, like, literally, haven't seen the sun in, like, 10, 11 days. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so I called them back at around 5 p.m. over there, and they were like, yes, you've been approved. I was like, okay, what the hell do I have to do now? So, like, I ran around. I had to get a new ticket. It cost me, like, 700 bucks. And, and then finally, finally got on the damn plane. I'm giving you the rough draft version, but this was <laughs> what it sounds like. Wow. Just, just, picture me, just picture me sitting in a Moscow airport the whole damn day, <laughs> not knowing if you're going to go home or not. I mean, lesson learned. So I, I can only imagine on that next trip to Russia, you will be checking that visa date every day, making sure it's correct. Listen, I'm, I'm getting I'm trying to get a year visa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, don't know, I mean, now, before we get into our Ask the Roost segment questions, I just want to remind you new listeners out there who may be listening on Breaking Muscle for the first time or wherever you are listening, uh, you can check out all of our previous episodes with other experts in the field of strength and conditioning like Dr. Corey Peacock, Zach Evanesh, Tony Ricci, PJ Nestler, Jake Bonacci, or Dan Garner. Then find our pages on iTunes, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play Music, Player FM, and on YouTube, and hopefully maybe soon Spotify. We'll try to get that done soon, too. Uh, so let's get all into these questions. You know, let's drop some knowledge bombs on the listeners and, and these people that want some answers from Phil Daru. Now, our first question is from, is from Kevin X. Cologne on Instagram. He asks, I read your article about building the base for fighters, but the only part I was confused about was your program hypertrophy for a weight class athlete. I agree with everything I've seen you do. I just want to know what you meant by hypertrophy uh, in the sense of weight class athletes. Uh, before you answer the question, can you just uh, let it, let the people know what that article is and where they can find it too? Yeah, you can find it on DarewStrong.com. Uh, it's in my uh, training blog section. But basically I was just talking about how I build a base from an outer camp perspective and how we build hypertrophy, joint integrity, things like that to help them get ready for for camp and uh you know just going in ready to go with a good work capacity and uh, not not having having to get in shape and already be in shape once they start camp um now thank you kevin x cologne for the question now the next one is from miami dot green on instagram he asked can hold you on, hold on hold on i didn't answer the question though oh you did you no, i'm sorry I did, oh. the technicalities i don't understand sometimes so <laughs> yeah oh, answer man. his well, question I got, I got to answer the man's question i can't <laughs> okay, do it <laughs> all right so that's what you can find the article but i'll answer the question okay. um you know basically what you have to do you have to look into the context of what i'm trying to say primarily fighters start their their out of camp program after a few weeks off from the fight which means they have just come off a long camp mm. and and most likely a weight cut so that's going to, you know, deter their weight and then also just bring down the metabolism in general. So what this means for a fighter is that they are somewhat detrained and, and most of the time in a catabolic state. 
just like a football player or something like that coming off a long season, they're not going to be as big and they're not going to be as strong as when they started the in season. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm trying to accomplish in the rebuilding process while initiating a greater work capacity with joint integrity, um, think think of uh, think of it as building like armor, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the, most of the time, uh, it's very hard to build muscle, especially with the amount of cardio based training these fighters perform with their skill specific training. So I can attest basically that it'll be very hard to build massive amounts of muscle in a six to 12 week span. And the muscle that they do gain is only to build them back up to where they can sustain the work ahead in camp with the muscle tissue. We build the metabolism will, will, you know, predominantly be faster, which leads to a metabolic, a better mm -hmm. metabolic rate, which can burn more body fat and have an easier time once they actually have to cut the weight. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, and I, and I do mean a leaner fighter, you know, can cut weight faster and more efficient. It just is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, water retention is lower and glycogen use is more optimally. So, you know, it, it just your muscles will be able to build and be able to sustain um, water reduction a lot easier. So that's the process of hypertrophy and that phase, and that's the reason why I do it pretty much. All right, Kevin, hope you got it. Get it, got it good. Uh, Miami.green on Instagram asks, can you recommend a cardio routine or circuit which will help burn fat and not result in muscle loss? He actually has a few more questions, but that's the first one. Yeah, yeah. So this is like a general approach. I don't know him specifically. Um, obviously, it's, it's all subjective, but as far as cardio work uh, that will fully promote pro protein synthesis and overall hormonal responses to help build or sustain muscle while burning fat efficiently, uh, is any type of high-intensity interval training or HIIT training. This could be short bursts of sprints followed by a brief, brief rest interval for a limited time. So, I mean, anything like Tabata-type style training, sprint intervals, you can even do it on an airdyne bike or an assault bike, things like that. Or I like to do personally, I like to have my guys do a prowler sprints with a 20 second rest, something like that. Um, now, the next question he has is uh, what kinds of nutrients should be consumed when you are trying to stay lean or have just worked out? Mm. Yeah, I mean, nutrients should you, you basically need to consume lean proteins, green vegetables, healthy fats complex carbohydrates, vitamins and minerals um, that will also play a key role in balancing out electrolytes and metabolism. You know, it's just something, you just got to eat healthy, man. You know what I mean? A lot of the times it's, it's you know, not going for the processed foods and, and trying to get as nutrient-dense, you know, products as possible to help you gain muscle, to lose fat, and to uh, help with that cardio response. Now, his final question <clears throat> is, Finally, what is the key to becoming incredibly strong on legs like you? Do you train heavy or do you mix? All right, first and foremost, let me just talk about I only have quads and hamstrings and glutes. I don't have any calves. So <laughs> he's not fully talking about my legs here. I have no calves, and trust me, I don't even know how I got how I got the little bit of calves I have because <laughs> I don't work them at all. Um, mm. Uh, but legs, I'm talking quads and hamstrings are primarily fast twitch fiber muscles. So if you're trying to get them strong, you must put adequate amounts of load and high amounts of force into each compound lift, like back squats, front squats, trap bar deads, uh, sumo deadlifts, and RDLs are all good lifts to produce absolute strength. Now, now keep volume slightly lower and intensity high, keep in a range of like 75 to 90% of your one rep max. And your volume needs to be fairly low. It needs to be five or less reps um, to, you know, to initiate more of a strength response. Um, if you're looking to build hypertrophy or muscle and size, a rep range of, uh, of three to six will still build some muscle. Uh, just make sure you are performing more sets to get that overall workload. So if you're trying to build a little bit more, more size on your legs, now, mind you, and this is with strength. This is not just size. If you were trying to build just size, you would be doing more of a hypertrophy range, which would be six to 12 reps. But for this, we're trying to build maximum strength and a little bit of uh, muscle gain. So you would do, like I said, three to six reps, but then you would do a, a, around eight to 10 sets. Mm -hmm. So you're still getting more workload and you're still getting, quote unquote, the volume, just not in a, in a repetitious factor. Um, yeah, and that's it. 
All right, thank you, Miami.Green, for the questions. Uh, also, just a reminder to anybody, for everybody listening, if you have questions of your own for Phil, we always do our Ask the Daru weekly segment, so you can always contact Phil on Instagram. You can contact us on our Faith, uh, Fight Strength uh, Facebook page, at Twitter, at Fight Strength underscore, or you can email us at Fight Strength uh, Podcast at Gmail. Uh, now, moving on to the next question. The next question is from Hart Gill. He asks, What's up, Coach? Huge fan of your work. Thank you for all the free knowledge bombs you drop. I have a question when it comes to ESD for Muay Thai. How would you set up the conditioning for it? Is it necessary to do lactic work? Yeah, so in Muay Thai, the training and competitions are primarily aerobic base. So building up a solid aerobic base through LSD work would be a good idea, like long, slow, low, di- or long, slow, distance um type work just like you know sustained uh same amount of uh, intensity throughout a long duration so just road work pretty much just like the old boxers used to do um and just kind of building up that vo2 now you can throw in some days of lactic and anaerobic work but your primary focus should be on vo2 max and heart rate control I would say as a general base program perform about three to four days of aerobic conditioning one day of anaerobic and one day of lactic, hmm. which uh, can help in all aspects of Muay Thai fighting. What is, is lactic uh, exercise or lactic work? What makes that different lactic, than anaerobic and stuff? Well, lactic glycolytic is kind of just like the circuit training, basically trying to get that lactic threshold, build that lactic threshold to where you can sustain a good amount of strength mm. and, uh, and endurance throughout yeah. you know a longer duration. So anaerobic is more like Lung capacity, uh, you know, the breathing techniques, and lactic is more muscle endurance. No, aerobic really is, is means with oxygen, and anaerobic means without oxygen. So mm. anaerobic conditioning would be short sprint intervals okay. uh, with, the, with an adequate amount of rest, and then aerobic would be a sustained amount of uh, aerobic work throughout a, a longer duration. All right, thank you, Hart Gill, for your question. Now, uh, this is Alexander underscore Kisler, also on Instagram. Uh, which screening and assessment method do you use for fighters? Yes, yeah, so my, my screening method is a mix of FMS, DNS, and my own sport-specific movements that will correlate into developing a plan for fighters' progress. Um, also, uh, also you you basically must must you know assess your fighters and or athletes on a daily basis. This is not something that you do just once. This is an everyday process. And if you're not doing this, then you're not actually adequately helping your your fighter or your athlete progress. And you're 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 gonna probably come into a point where they might sustain an injury because you're not paying attention. So this does help with prevention of injury and sport performance. What I mean by FMS is a functional movement screen and dynamic neuromuscular stabilization mm-hmm. techniques. Okay. No, I mean, I just also just like standard things like watching them, watching, watching them roll and watching them spar, things like that to see where deviations are, um, maybe in their foot, maybe in their feet as if they like if they supinate a lot or if they have like weak feet, uh, weak ankles, weak hips, weak knees, how they turn and twist and work in a transverse plane and things like that. That can kind of tell me where they're weak at and uh, where their imbalances lie. So I can actually fix that from a program perspective. Now, he also has a, a couple more questions. The second question is, uh, what are your top three methods to improve punch power and speed? Yeah, this is like a broad question, but <clears throat> I mean, obviously, plyometrics is going to help rate of force development. So it's going to help with obviously force output, which is going to help with power output and then speed um, There's a general focus between if you don't have speed and strength, you're not going to have power. So if you can develop that type of uh if you can develop that type of uh, uh, response, then it'll help. Uh, med ball throws are always good. Mm. You know, I, I do it a lot in my in my videos. Uh, rotational throws, things like that. Anything that's going to help with velocity and putting force through a external load. And then deadlifts. And deadlifts are a full body movement. They primarily work the posterior chain, which is going to help with uh, with uh, generating force throughout the entire body now I, i've always seen you know and i've seen in your videos and even other you know a trainer's videos the, the the med ball throws what is that specifically working is that really working everywhere is it a, a core specific exercise like what what are the the benefits of med ball throws 
I mean, the true benefit is explosive power, mm. you know, uh, and then also it depends on what you're trying to accomplish or what you're doing, what type of exercise. But I use it for a, a number of different things when it comes to postural alignment, learning how to throw from the ground up, using your torque from your feet all the way up mm. into outer extremities. Um, also reintegrating intra-abdominal pressurization by tightening up the core or, like I said, proximal stability with distal mobility, being able to be tight in the core and then also transverse that energy out into the outer extremities just like you would as you would throw a punch. Mm. So it's the best way to simulate a punch without having to actually punch somebody. All right, fair enough. Now, uh, Alexander's last question. How often in a week do you do interval training for fighters? Uh, yeah, it, it depends on the strengths and the weaknesses of the fighter. Um, primarily, this is done on phase two of camp, which is pushed to the last day of the week for the fighters. I, I have this so that, you know, they have enough juice to get through the week and can finish strong before the weekend and they can rest up. Um, now, the intervals can be anything, too. I mean, you could have intervals from, you know, long duration, meaning lactic or an anaerobic interval. So if you're talking lactic, like I said, with the circuit training intervals, that's going to be in phase two. Um, the end of phase one goes into, it kind of potentiates into a uh, anaerobic phase. So you'll be doing sprint intervals to get that good anaerobic capacity. Now, I've done, I've done, I've done articles in the past and I've, you know, stated in some blog posts that, you know, anaerobic conditioning, they found that actually helps with the increase of aerobic capacity. So doing short sprint intervals will actually help the entire aerobic threshold which is obviously good because you're not beating down the joints and having to uh, take your fast twitch fibers that you have and turn into slow twitch fibers. And that can be done if somebody does move in a slow manner or does high amounts of volume um, in their training sessions and they can turn into a fast explosive athlete um, or, you know, they could turn from a fast explosive athlete into a, you know, a marathon runner, mm -hmm. you know, per se, per yeah. se, not yeah. saying that it's, you know, but, you know, they, they did show studies that, yeah, you can actually change fiber types depending on your training modalities. Wow. Uh, thank you, Alexander underscore Kisler on Instagram. Now for our final question, this comes from Rizinator uh, on Instagram. He asks, I'm trying to lose 20 pounds of body fat and gain 20 pounds of muscle. I, I'm, I'm actually interested in this one myself. Uh, should I do a split road routine of full body workout when it comes to my lifting? And how often should I do cardio? Yeah, man, this is a, this is pretty far fetched. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, it, I mean, this is pretty hard to do putting into account human physiology and thermal and thermogenics mm -hmm. in order to build muscle primarily you have to be in a calorie surplus and in order to lose weight you must be in a calorie deficit yeah. so the two kind of run into each other mm -hmm. now if you're a novice to lifting and, and eating healthy this rule really doesn't apply somewhat to you because it's such a new stimulus for your body you're going to try they're going to it's going to try to adapt mm -hmm. so you may actually build some muscle and lose some body fat if you're just beginning, you know, your fitness goals and things yeah, like that, which I've seen. Yeah. I've I've seen it happen. I've had clients that that's, you know, that's done that, but also I have clients that that gain weight in the beginning and they're like, oh, my God, I'm gaining weight. But in all actuality, you're actually gaining muscle tissue and then you're building your metabolic rate, which will in turn, you know, burn the body fat. But you just got to give it time, you know. Um, but from a training perspective. You know, I would think that this is going to be some what of a of a constant struggle for somebody that's been training for right. three to five years. You know, something like that. Yeah, because I mean, I think about it myself. Like when I lost all my weight, I did like lose fat and gain muscle, but I was like a, a you know a really heavy person. So I mean, yeah, I, I can't imagine a, a high level athlete is. I mean, I can I can't even imagine it's even for high level athletes or athletes in general easy to lose twenty pounds anyway. And, you know, how, how they would do it. So, yeah. So this works in summation. Works for someone just starting working out. But for someone that's already an athlete, I mean, is it possible to maybe five and five if you're, you know, already an athlete and trying to do something? Maybe you lose five pounds fat, five pounds muscle. Like, you know, is that is that possible? Yeah, that can be possible. It just It just really depends on their diet, the way they train, the way they recover, and then also their rehydration process. But... 
I mean, to be honest, if you're if you're more of a higher level guy or you know you're you're advanced in your programming, like you want to actually have a season or like a span amount of time to where you're actually building some body fat because it's going to help you get stronger. It's going to help you build more hypertrophy. And then in time you can bring that, you can bring those calories down and from the muscle that you've gained, you can then cut away the fat and you'll actually be bigger than where you were. Um, it will be, what I'm saying is you'll be bigger from a muscular standpoint. You may be five pounds heavier, but you're 5% less in body fat. Mm, See what I'm saying? Um, now that's our last question. Thank you, Risenator, for your question. I mean, before we go, I know you wanted to bring it up a real quick. Uh, thoughts on a, a possible Dustin Poirier title shot? Like, what, what, what are you feeling about that? So, let me go ahead and pull this text message up. So, <laughs> Dustin, so Dustin texts me today. <clears throat> he goes, I'm going to beat Eddie, then I'm going to win the belt. Is that, Simply- is that happening? Is that like a, a plan in the, in the works for a rematch, or he's still hoping for that? I mean, we we are still hoping, but I think that that's got to be something that they got to they have to give him. You know what I mean? I think it's, so. I mean, they're both kind of like right there, especially Dustin. He he's been great since he's been at one fifty five. Yeah, man. In and that in and that that fight with Pettis, I think that kind of solidified us. Oh, yeah. As you know, being a, a top contender, mm-hmm. you know, it's, and now with Eddie, he, we basically beat Eddie. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I, I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that. Oh, you know, it's my fighter. He's my boy. I can honestly say that we could have finished Eddie if we needed to, but we need to be a little bit more calculated in our approach. Yeah. Now we're a little bit more we're a little bit more keen to the situation. We know what we need to do. And I feel Dustin will put him away in the second. Now, if we get that rematch, we don't know if we will. Hopefully we will. Once that happens, then we get the title shot, either Ferguson or, or Connor if he steps back in. So I mean, Hopefully. it's crazy. It's a completely fluid situation going on right now because Connor is in flux. And, and like I said here a mo- like two months ago, I don't see why he would want to come back. And based off of Dana White's recent comments, there is no real reason for him to come back, and he doesn't have much interest um, unless yeah. he owes the Irish mob money. That's a possibility too. Um, yeah. But, I mean, he's not coming back. You got get Ferguson thing. It's a weird. I think it's going to be interesting because it almost feels like Habib versus Barboza is an eliminator, but you do have Dustin who is really right there. If he were to fight uh, uh, Alvarez, a former champion, and beat him, that says a lot. You know, where's Ferguson fight next? Kevin Lee got a title shot when I don't think he really should have got it. He talked his way into it. So I almost feel like at this point, Dustin, who's super nice, really nice guy, charitable, he may need to go to that Colby Covington school of trash talk Get that name up a little bit more so you can kind of skip somebody. Thoughts on Colby maybe mentoring Dustin in his shit talk? <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. But what are your thoughts about maybe he needs to start talking more trash to kind of get that, talk himself into a fight? Because unfortunately, you know, for, for, for a lot of fighters, that's the, the way you get tile shots these days. You have to talk your way into it. Merit is not what it once was. Unfortunately, yeah, that may be true. But also, Dustin is an exciting fighter, though. Well, oh, yeah, for, so, without a doubt. So it's not really – I mean, if you're not an exciting fighter, then, yeah, maybe you do have to talk like that. But he he truly lets his actions speak louder than his words. So I don't see it being an issue. I think that it will be a great fight for the fans. What I see on Twitter, everybody's wanting that fight. So mm-hmm. hopefully they're paying attention to it. I even, I even uh, tagged Sean Shelby in it. When I when I retweeted what I what I talked about, you know, as far as getting a rematch and then getting a title shot, you know, I just I simply state Sean Shelby let us eat, you know, so <laughs> yes, hopefully uh... he'll let us. So I mean, it, it, honestly, I, I do hope we get it. Um, he's already ready. I mean, listen, Dustin's right now. He's he's doing my out of camp program mm-hmm. and he's ready to go. He's like he's already feeling like he's ready to go for camp. So, you know, we stay ready. That's that's the main thing is that. There's no, there's not a time in his, in in this year, in his years of training that he's not ready to fight on short notice, you know, but you give us eight weeks and it's a wrap. Yep. I mean, and, and let's also, since we're talking about former Fight Straight podcast guests and title shots, I mean, can we not get a title shot for Tisha Torres? 
I mean, yeah. other than Joanna, Joanna, another former guest, Joanna, you know, just take a vacation, hang out, maybe do some damage at 125. You know, Tisha Torres, let her it, let it, let it get that, that taste of a title shot. You know, you're the best. You don't need the, the rematch right away. Tisha Torres, I think more than anybody, deserves a title shot after w her win against Michelle Waterson last night. The girls only lost once. Close fight to the champion, I believe. I mean, let her get that towel shot. It sells itself. Fast any fight. How about that? Yeah, of course. I mean, Tisha is obviously somebody that I'm close to, but and then I, I honestly, like I told you before, off 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 the air. But you know, I think that uh, I think they're not going to give Joanna a, a shot, and I think that they will give Tisha the shot because of the fact that you know Joanna got finished in the first. Whereas, yeah, there may have been some issues there, and that may not have been 100% Joanna, but mm -hmm. at the same time, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we know. But, <laughs> and, and you know, I'm not making excuses at all for her, you know, and, and she she doesn't need it from me, you know, mm -hmm. but the thing is, is that nine times out of ten, Joanna will beat Rose, mm -hmm. just simply as that, you know. So I think that, uh, I don't think that there's anything to really truly prove um, obviously, I don't want a close friend of mine and then one of my closest fighters fight each other, mm, um, especially boy. for a title, uh, especially for a title. But that's something that comes with the comes with the territory, comes with the job. Uh, we'll, we'll, you know, go down that path when we get there. But uh, I do but want yeah. that to happen just to see the torture you would have to go through. It'd be fascinating I'll to watch. I bet you fucking would. <laughs> I bet you would. <laughs> you asshole. <laughs> nah, um, you know, but, I, I, man, I'm super happy for Tisha. I'm proud of her. You know, she's actually, she looks she looks phenomenal, you know, and, and I could tell that she's in a good place right now with her and Raquel out there in Colorado, and she's super happy, which is also good for the, for the fight, fighter psyche. And that can play a huge role in, in your performance. Yeah. I mean, with all that said, I mean, that is the end of our show. I feel, as always, give them the social media so they can follow you on Instagram, see these amazing videos. They can catch up on some of this, uh, the Bear Code videos from Russia, and the, on the Snapchat too, Facebook, all those social media outlets. Well, well one thing I also want to announce is that I'm going to be doing more seminars throughout the year. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I'll be doing a couple in, in uh, Poland. And I'll be doing a couple in the UK. And obviously, I'll be traveling back and forth from Russia. But I do want to hear from anybody in Iceland, Finland, Sweden, anybody overseas. If you want me to come out and teach you some of my methods, do a full clinic for a weekend, for a full week, let me know. You can either email me, phil at derustrong.com. You can email the show. DM me on Instagram at Daru Strong. Mm -hmm. uh, my Twitter is at Daru Strong, and uh, you can follow me also with all my my videos there on a daily basis on Snapchat Daru Strong One. Also, I'll be putting out new templates uh, for for a different variety of uh, of strength programming. This could be anything from uh, general fitness to MMA strength and conditioning. I'm also be doing a power building template. So I'm coming out with a lot of new things, a lot of big things coming up this year. Also, if you're in the states, if you want me to come by and do a uh, and do a uh, a seminar there with a presentation and a and a and a full-on clinic teaching you some of my methods and uh, some of the stuff that you've seen on Instagram, uh, you know, make sure you hit me up. So that's about it, Jason. It's been uh, it's been swell, man. Been telling you about my my uh, my Russian problem that I had to get back to no visa, but been a good time yeah i mean uh, you know also uh my personal my instagram uh, uh jericho vendetta cheap seas chat on twitter ne also don't forget as i mentioned before you want any questions for this expert we have here every week and phil drew you got questions for him you can always holler at us on fight strength on, the, on our facebook fight strength podcast on facebook or on twitter fight strength underscore remember all of our previous episodes including FSP Overtime, where we just talk MMA talk. You can go find iTunes, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play Music, Player FM, YouTube, all those places. I am Jason Burgos. He is Phil DeRue. I feel say bye-bye. Uh, peace. <laughs>